New friends, new opportunities, new partners. EG Tax. There you go. Tiffany, thank you very much. As, as Tiffany mentioned, I've uh, known Esther for, uh, for decades now and worked with Esther and Tiffany and Chris and a lot of the folks over at EG Tax when they have clients who have estate related questions, estate planning, elder law, that sort of thing. Uh, I've kind of, kind of become a member of their team and help out their clients. Uh, as Tiffany, when Tiffany said, if you have any questions afterwards, I think I'm kind of old school. So as we're going through, if something occurs to you and you have a question while we're talking, I, I think interactive is, uh, is a very good way to do these kind of sessions. So feel free to ask your question while, while we're going through. I don't want it just to be a straight, bland uh, presentation. So if something occurs to you that I'm talking about that you want to learn more about, Raise your hand and uh, we'll talk about it right then because somebody else might have the same, same type of question. So I would encourage a, a kind of an interactive session. And just by the way, a quick introduction. As an attorney, my firm is a law firm of Katz and Berry. We're located uh, not maybe about a mile from here over on Main Street, Main and Harris Hill. Our firm's been around since 1992 and we do nothing but estate planning. We do uh, elder law, the estate world is really uh, our, right, our firm is dedicated to. Uh, very kind of unique in, in the fact that we don't, uh, that we've specialized in that area and have been doing that for, uh, for really our whole, my whole career and my partner Mark Berry's uh, whole career also. So when we talk about estate, the, the estate world, there's really, the estate planning world, there's really, th it's three components. One would be estate taxes, the other would be elder law, which is something that uh, probably prompts a lot of questions relating to what happens if a person needs to go into a nursing home and that sort of thing. And then the other is just basic estate planning, which is wills and trusts and uh, wills, trusts, uh, powers of attorney, any of those types of documents that go into building your estate plan. So those are the topics that I'm gonna cover uh, today. I hope that meets with everybody's expectations. If there's somebody, something else that you thought we should talk about, just let me know and I'll be happy to answer that question too. So, and I'm really going to function uh, without uh, uh, without using the uh, um, uh, without using the uh, the prompter because I'll just do it kind of old school and talk talk our way through it. Does that make sense, Tiff? Okay, good. So, so from that perspective, uh, you know, uh, Tiffany uh, put that together, which is very nice about uh, a little bio about myself. So let's talk about estate taxes or taxes for a second. So that's, that's one of the most uh, big concerns that people have is when they die, what's gonna happen from a tax perspective as people inherit the money. So, you know, if, if mom passes away and money goes to her kids, do the kids have to pay taxes on the money that they inherit? Well, this, this country does have a pretty uh, severe and penal estate tax system uh, that, that is imposed, that's the bad news. The good news is that that exemption is now very high. That exemption is well in excess of $10 million per person. So basically everybody, and most, the vast majority of people in the United States don't have to worry about estate taxes anymore. That threshold used to be much lower. It's now moved up to 10 million plus, which means that if, if uh, the money goes from one generation to the next and you don't cross over that threshold, there's no money to be paid in estate taxes as it passes to uh, to the children. So I presume that's good news for most everybody because if, if, if you happen to have owned the Buffalo Bills, it was worth more than a billion dollars, then there could be a very hefty estate tax. And, and people who, are, who have estates that are in excess of, of, the, uh, of the threshold do have to worry about uh, planning for that uh, eventuality of paying those estate taxes. And one of the things that that does is actually does encourage charitable planning, and that's one of the things that Ralph Wilson did. And if you, if you notice, if you watch and read in the Buffalo News on a regular basis, you can see that there is uh, uh, significant charitable bequests coming from the Ralph Wilson Foundation to our community. And it's an absolutely wonderful thing because he took the, gr the, the vast majority of the proceeds of the sale of the bills and set up a charitable trust for the benefit of both Western New York and, uh, for the, and uh, Michigan, Detroit. So a lot of his money from the bills that we all spent on our tickets for all those years supporting our team has, is coming back to our community. And that was motivated in part, at least by uh, the avoidance of estate taxes. And because of that, we in Western New York are receiving a real benefit from that. So, 
Yeah, so it's very cool. Yeah, so it's very cool that, and it's a, it's really a wonderful, a wonderful legacy that Ralph Wilson left to the Western New York community. Uh, and in terms of taxes, as assets pass from one generation to the next, the only other uh, tax part of that would be: is there an income tax consequence? In the big picture, there's no income tax consequence when you inherit money. So if mom and dad pass away and the money comes to the kids, and let's say the house sells for $200,000, the kids would receive the $200,000 and they get that money tax-free with no income tax consequence uh, to them whatsoever. The only exception to that, does anybody know what the exception to that might be? 401k uh, deferred money. So in other words, if you have an IRA or a deferred annuity, something that is that the income tax has been deferred by it, during your lifetime, as that passes on to the children, then that's going to have an income tax consequence. So, yes? Okay, so the, the question there is, what about gifts that have been made during the lifetime, a home in, in particular, What's the tax consequence on that? So when, I, when, when a house is gifted, and actually it's done quite frequently, it, it usually in the form of a deed with a life estate, if that rings any, any bell, mom and dad give the house to the kids, they, and then they keep a life interest or a life estate, and then the kids uh, own the house, and it's a split, it's really a split ownership interest during the balance of mom's lifetime. So if the house is sold after death, so in other words, if the house could, mom continues to live in the house the rest of her lifetime, and then she passes away, then they do get a stepped up basis at death, which would wipe out any of the income tax consequences. If it's sold during lifetime, then there is no stepped up basis and there could be an income tax consequence to the kids who sell the house if there is a capital gain uh, based, on the, based on the sale price. So, yes? Uh, I have a, I'm making an assumption that Required minimum distribution uh, uh, given to the heir, okay, can be stretched out over their lifetime. That's a correct yes. assumption. Yes. Okay. What's the story with the law? Okay, so let me, let me your question had, it, within your question was information, so let's, let's put that out there first. So, so when we were talking about IRAs, the, when, when somebody dies, the IRA is going to be taxable. Somebody has to pay taxable, you get taxes. You know, you take your $2,000, you put it in an IRA every year, you're deferring the tax. Well, hopefully you will be the person that's gonna pay that tax because hopefully you'll live a long time and you'll withdraw the money and pay the tax. But if you pass away, then that IRA, this is what the gentleman's question was getting at, then that IRA is going to be taxable to the person that inherits it. And that, I'll get your question in a second. So what happens is that IRA can then be stretched out, which is called a stretch IRA or an inherited IRA over the recipient's lifetime. So to, to further expand on that, so mom has an IRA that has $100,000 and she has one child who's, who inherits it upon death. So that child can take the IRA and convert it into their own inherited IRA or stretch IRA as, it, as it's sometimes called and stretch out the distributions over the balance of their lifetime. So the income tax will have to be paid, but it doesn't have to be paid in the year that mom dies. It doesn't have to be paid within five years of when mom dies, which used to be the law. So she could, they could, the kids can then stretch it out over their lifetime and take the RMD over their lifetime. And that's really what the gentleman's question, the information contained in his question was actually in there, is you can do that, create an inherited IRA. And in almost every situation, I would recommend that the person who inherits the money would do that. And so. They could still take the five-year option, they could take the one-day option. They could take all the money and put it in their own name the next day and pay the income tax on the full amount. If it's 100,000, take it out the next day and that's taxable income to them. Make sure the so, heirs are very young. Well, and if the heirs are young, then you can stretch it out over their whole lifetime. So, so, so then therefore the, uh, the RMD, uh, which usually is taken by, a, by somebody who's over 70 years old, is taken by the person who inherits it, and then that can be a very small amount if, the, if they're young. And then the question was, what about the Roth IRA? Well, the Roth IRA is a non-taxable inheritance. So, so when it's inherited, because the, there's, uh, the tax, the, there's no tax consequence to the beneficiary on the Roth, so we don't need to worry about that. No RMD? There's no RMD. 
So, cause, so, that, so that's one of the benefits of a Roth if you do it, if you, do, if you wanted to, to do a Roth. So yeah, so it's, it's a, it's a tax-free inheritance because you're prepaying the, the, uh, the income tax when you convert from a... Well, well, if the, the only issue would be that if you buy, if you convert it, then the Roth has some growth built in there, and then that, but that's tax free. So normally, a person who inherits a Roth doesn't keep it as a Roth; they just take the money. Take it and run. Well, take it and run, take it and use it. Yes, because you don't need to because it's not an IRA. So, 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 yep. So those questions. That was our first topic, which is really the in, income tax or the estate taxes on an inheritance. So, any other questions on that? Yes, sir. Yes. That's a very good point. So, correct. So even if you have a very young spouse, you don't, you it, do we, when you have an IRA and it was going to kids, that's the rules that I was I was talking about that they have to then turn into an RMD. It's a gentleman's question points out if it's if you're the person inheriting it is a spouse regardless of age so if somebody has a uh, a spouse who is uh, very young and 50 years old 40 years old and unfortunately has left that person as a widow they don't have to start with their rmd until they become 70 and a half so so that's a spousal rollover so basically what happens between spouses if the husband dies and the money goes to the wife she just turns it into her ira and there's no it, it's just her ira subject to the regular ira rules that yes that's a regular IRA, traditional IRA. Yes? What would you predict would be the taxes on percentage of the... It's actually, it's not a prediction. The taxes are, it goes right onto your ordinary income. So in other words, if somebody withdraws $1,000 out of their IRA, that's $1,000 of ordinary income that just gets added to their regular income. So the, the, the consequence for that is that it is taxable as if you had made another thousand dollars at your job. So, so it just it's or, money coming out of the IRA is ordinary income. So it just goes to your taxes. So, yes. So, if the children inherit the IRA, right? Um, what you're saying is they can spread it out over their lifetime. They still will pay taxes on it. But so, what's the advantage of paying it up front or taking it out? Uh, in well, generally, there's no advantage of taking it up front. Most of the time, the children who inherit an IRA would prefer to spread it out. The advantage of taking it up front is you get the money if you need to use it to pay off a mortgage, buy a house, or something like that, and take it out of the IRA. But for most people who don't need the money immediately for a specific use, they would prefer to treat it as an inherited IRA and stretch it out over their lifetime. That's a much better tax system. So. Okay, you're right. So your your question is perfect because the next topic is elder law and protecting the assets if we go into uh, if we go into a nursing home. So so I'm going to take your question. I'm going to use that as our transition. The answer to your question is yes, you are correct. But but I want to get there. So but your question was absolutely correct. So so that will that'll allow us to leave our first topic of estate taxes and move on to what I call elder law. I, I'm really an elder law specialist as an attorney, and elder law is really a field that's been around now for quite some time. It's helping families protect their money or deal with the issues of transitioning into an into a nursing home. And it's and it's a very big issue. I mean Western New York, what do nursing homes cost? Fourteen, fourteen thousand dollars a month, fifteen thousand dollars a month, thirteen thousand dollars—a fortune. You know, I mean, that's that's you know, we're talking four to five hundred dollars a day. So I mean, you could stay in the Ritz for that. So so that's that's with that with that cost, there needs to be a method of trying to uh, protect the money if uh, if a family wants to do so. And that's really what elder law is. And that's what we're going to talk about is the rules, the rules that allow people uh, to do that and how that gets done. So first off, we, the real question is, if somebody goes to a nursing home and we have a bill, a very substantial bill of $14,000 a month or, or something in that vicinity, how is that going to get paid? Well, the first way that could get paid is by insurance. 
And there's two types of insurance. One would be your basic health insurance. So everybody has Medicare or some form of Medicare, Blue Cross Blue Shield, independent health that, that is available and that will pay for some portion of the nursing home care, what's basically, what's usually called rehab. So in other words, and I'll use, I'll, I'll keep using the word mom in this context as we describe what's gonna happen. And I'm not picking on my mother because she's still alive and well and uh, wouldn't want this to be her. But so, so if, if uh, uh, if mom had to go to the nursing home and, and it, something happened, so she slipped and fell at home and broke her hip, then she would go to rehab first. And rehab is generally in a nursing home, so rehab then would be paid for by health insurance. So therefore, health insurance is paying the first component of being in the nursing home, which is the rehab part of that. That's the good news. The bad news is they don't pay for very much. Health insurance pays for anywhere between 20 and 100 days, usually on the lower end, depending on, on what the rehab situation is. And then when that runs out, health insurance does not pay for the nursing home care. So at that point in time then, you're just down to either private pay or, or the governmental assistance of Medicaid. And that's really what the question is. Most of the consultations, when people are talking to an attorney about, uh, about elder law, they're really talking about uh, they're talking about Medicaid. They're talking about try, what can we do to protect mom or mom and dad's assets uh, if, if they need to go into a nursing home. So let's talk about those rules because that's really, I think, what a lot of people uh, might have questions about and that's why, uh, and that's I think what might, might have brought you here today. So basically, the first question there is Medicaid qualification. So in order to qualify for Medicaid, you have to reach their, their qualification rules and if and their qualification or eligibility levels. If you don't, then your private pay and the family pays for it out of their own funds. Because the, the Medicaid program is, is available only for those who qualify. And, and that makes sense, because who is Medicaid? Well, we're Medicaid, Medicaid's the government. It's our tax dollars. When we're paying our real property taxes and other taxes into the, into the county system, that's the tax dollars that are being used to pay for people to be in a to be in a nursing home, so of course we want that we only want to be paying for those that are legitimately eligible, and that's that's where uh, that's where the county works to protect the rights of the of the Erie County citizens. So we're, we're they're not paying or we're not paying for people who don't really belong on Medicaid, but certainly there are there are these qualification levels, and if you do things legally, then you're eligible for Medicaid. So. So let's take, let's take the basic rules first so we can understand the format. There's two types of people that would go into a, into a nursing home. One would be a single individual, and then one would be somebody who is part of a married couple, either the husband and wife. So if you are a single individual, so in other words, if it's just mom, dad's already passed away, and mom goes into the nursing home, for her to get on Medicaid, she can have the following. She can have basically no money, which is defined as $15,100. So if she has more money than that, then Medicaid does not pay the bill. That's the, that's the resource allowance that they're allowed to have. You're really not allowed to have a house because that would put you over the resource allowance, but there are ways to keep, those, to keep the house and still get on Medicaid. So you, you can actually have the house, but, the, but the, uh, the county would put a lien on the house if it was ever sold, that the proceeds would have to go back to the county. So, so a person is not forced to sell their house if they go into a facility, they can, get, they can get on Medicaid, but then the county has the right to put a lien against the house. And then the third part about that, and that's what this, question, this lady's question was, uh, uh, was about, was if you have an IRA or an IRA-related asset, a 401k, a TSA, a 403b, a, a TIA CREF account, anything that's really a deferred uh, retirement <coughs> asset, the government treats that as a pension. Because if you think about it, when you were putting money into your IRA, you were doing so for your retirement. So the government treats that as a pension, and then, the, then you can have a lot of money, any amount of money, in your IRA account, but the income goes to the nursing home, but you can still get on Medicaid and have a $100,000 IRA, a $200,000 IRA, a $500,000 IRA or more, and still be on Medicaid. Can I stop you for a second? Yes. When you talk about income, annuitizing your IRA, uh, are you insinuating that you could limit that to an RMB or 
do they mm -hmm. ask you to go over the RMD? It, it's, a, it's an amount that they calculate is slightly higher than the RMD, but using the RMD just for, for uh, discussion's sake makes sense. So in other words, you have an, R, you have an IRA, well, let's, let's use an example. Somebody has an IRA and has $400,000 in their IRA. They go into a facility, okay, and they're a single individual like we're talking about. So, so they have less than $15,000 in the bank. They've sold their house, so they were living in an apartment, and then they have this IRA. So Medicaid would pay for the nursing home care. The IRA is, is part of their income. All of their income, Social Security, pension, and the, the RMD off the IRA would all go to the nursing home. But Medicaid would pay the difference. So, would it, well, you have to take out your RMD, and then that's the income. So just use RMD. And it's an easy, yeah. So it's an easy way to think of it that way. So, and plus pension, plus Social Security. So, so, so the big uh, misnomer for many people is that you, you that the IRA would be in jeopardy. And in New York State, it's actually unique. Most states don't have this law. New York State, it's a very good law that we have for the citizens of uh, New York that allows the IRA to be protected for, treated as a pension and therefore protected. Is so, law protected? Is, is the Roth IRA can be protected too, yes. Okay. So, well, you do have to take the withdrawals out. So, because you, so you do have to take the money out. So, so that's that's a single individual. For a married couple, okay, if you have a married couple, then it's very different rules. So now we have mom and dad. Uh, dad, dad's alive and well and it, it's living in the house. Mom has gotten sick and she goes to the nursing home. So if mom is in the nursing home now, what would allow her to qualify for Medicaid? And in order for her to qualify for Medicaid, there's the community spouse. She's the community spouse. The community spouse is allowed to keep uh, the house regardless of value. So dad's at home, so they want to, the, the government allows the, the dad to keep the house without as an exempt asset. Dad's allowed to keep also, let's just call it $75,000 of assets of his own and then $15,000 for mom. So we'll call it $90,000. There's, there's some variance in that, but just as a discussion point, that's a good number for, uh, uh, to keep in mind. So, so, there, so dad can stay at home, or the community spouse can stay at home, keep the house, keep $90,000, and again, keep the IRAs, and then also keep income because dad's living at home, so he needs to have income. So the income that he would be allowed to keep would be approximately $3,000 a month. Anything over that would be income that would go to, to the nursing home. So, so the, when you have a community spouse, the laws are set up that the person who stays at home is allowed to keep enough money to let them stay at home, which is the house, which is the $90,000, which is the income of $3,000 a month, including income coming off of the IRAs. So, so, and then when you are above that amount, then Medicaid is not involved. So this gets back to, now we're shifting it back to Medicaid qualification, because that's what really this, is, this discussion is about. So how does mom or mom, if she's a community, if there's a community spouse, get on to Medicaid if we're above those limits? Well, basically, if you're above those limits, you don't get on Medicaid. You know, because then you, you don't qualify for Medicaid if you went and asked, asked Medicaid to pay for the long-term care because you're in a nursing home because you had, you had more money, Medicaid would say, no, you have too much money. So families sometimes say, well, what can we do? We're worried about mom and dad. Mom, mom has gotten uh, sick and we're worried if she goes into a nursing home, how are we going to protect the assets? And that's where the planning comes, comes in uh, as an opportunity for, for families. So any planning that's done, uh, there's, there's a five-year look back. So people may be familiar with that. What that means is that if mom and dad had assets, or we'll go back to just mom, if mom has assets and she, she's worried that she's not gonna be able to stay at home and she wants to protect those assets, she is allowed to give away those assets to her children or to a trust or to, to get them out of her own name, but that, that must be done five years in advance of her, of her applying for Medicaid. So that's where the five-year look back comes in play. Have you heard about the five-year look back before? Okay, any questions about that, how the five-year look back might work? Okay, so, so that's, where that, that's where the gifting comes into play, would be with the, with, uh, uh, the, the gifting, uh, it has to be done five years in advance of applying for Medicaid. Yes? Is it 60 months or five years? 
it's five years to the day. So it's so it's so when you when somebody applies for Medicaid. So if somebody applied for Medicaid on November first of two thousand and eighteen, then they would look back to the the Medicaid process looks back to November first of two thousand and thirteen. So October thirty first of two thousand and thirteen, if the family had gifted away money, that is an exempt gift. So it's right it's right to the day. So uh, in terms of where they look back. So yes. Would that five year look back also apply to the, the like state strategy for passing uh, Okay, that's an excellent question because that's a strategy. So let's talk about your again, your question has lots of information in it, so let's talk about that. So the answer is yes to your question, but the gentleman said, what about a deed with a life estate? So let's define what, what we're talking about. Very common when a family is looking to protect their assets, one of the things they're trying to protect is the house, the family house. So they would see an attorney like myself or somebody else and they would do what's called a deed with a life estate. So what that means is they take the house, so mom would take the house and she would deed the house to the children and then she would retain what's called a life estate. Life estate is really life ownership in the house. And the reason it's done that way is twofold. The primary reason is because that protects the house. So that five years from now, and that's what the gentleman's question was, does that five years apply to the deed with the life estate? And the answer is yes, because so mom deeds the house November of 2013 to her kids and then after November of 2018, she goes into a nursing home. The house is now a protected asset because of the five-year look back. And, and it's a really, it's a wonderful strategy that, that, uh, that we're allowed to employ to help a family protect the house. Because what happens is the life estate means it's still mom's house. Mom owns the house from, for all practical purposes. Mom pays the taxes. Mom lives there. Mom pays the insurance. She cuts the lawn if she can. Uh, and it's still her house. She still continues to get the property tax exemption. So if she's eligible for a star exemption or a veteran's exemption, those exemptions retained, are retained on the house because she has retained a life estate or a life ownership. And the primary reason that people do it is then the house is protected if, if long-term care is needed more than five years from now. Yes, sir. Yeah, so what, what happens is if, if we do a deed with a life estate, uh, uh, the question really is what happens if that house is then sold, which would not be uncommon. You have the family home and then mom and dad want to sell the house and move into a smaller house, a condo, which sometimes is more expensive than a regular house, but, but they want to sell the house and downsize. So what could happen in that situation is you could continue with the same ownership structure to the new home. In other words, the house sells for $200,000 and you want to go buy a $200,000 condo, you just take that money and go buy and have the kids take the proceeds from the sale of the first house and buy the condo that they would continue to own for mom and dad to live in. So, so that, that strategy kind of continues on from one house to the next. So, and, would, and the same five year protective element, which is where we started this, would be, uh, would be available. What about other assets? Well, the other assets, we're talking about the house, we're gonna shift to the other assets in a second. So, yes. Is, as, the question is, what about the property tax exemption? So what happens is the property tax exemption, we're talking about exemptions, we're talking about veterans exemptions, senior exemptions, senior star, anything that reduces property taxes. So in order for the property taxes to be reduced, you have to qualify, and the senior is usually the person that's qualifying, and as long as that person continues to have a life estate, life ownership, life interest in the house, they do qualify for the exemption. So in other words, if they move from one house to the next, you'd still have the, the senior would still have that property tax exemption. For example, you said the kids take the 200,000 house. Correct, but mom would, also take, uh, the, mom would also take her interest, the life estate interest, and put it in the new house. So, so yes, so you're, you're correct in terms of expanding what I said, so that's perfect, yep. Yes, sir, yeah. I want to go back to an earlier point uh, about the 90,000 approximately. Yes. Yep. That's it. You are not getting Medicaid for long-term care, period. Not in the future when it drops below that or anything like that. 
so the que what the question gets at is where does the $90,000 exemption fit? It's basically on date of application. So if somebody goes into a nursing home and they have more money, they have 100, a, a community spouse has $150,000, well then you would spend down to the, to the level where you would apply and then apply. So know that you can't get on until you reach the appropriate levels. That's so. They allow you to do that. So they, you know, I got 100,000. I know I got to get down to 90. I somehow spend 10,000 dollars. Yep, prepay a funeral would be a good example. Okay. So prepay a funeral. And then, and then I've hit it at a point in time. Now, let's say I just can't do that. I got a couple hundred thousand. There's nothing I can do. I've now failed for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. Correct, and, that, and that's actually, again, a good transition to the next point. What happens if we have more money, because we, we're leaving the house. Does anybody have any other questions on the house or a deed with a life estate? Let me, and then I'll get back to your question. Yes? How many houses can you do it? Uh, it's your principal residence. So, so, so is, as the, the, the community spouse has an exemption on their principal residence, within the, within the, within the five-year mark, if it's more than five years and you've gifted away, you could gift away uh, the Empire State Building. If it was prior to the five years, so it wouldn't it wouldn't matter how many houses you had at that point. But all within the five year, the only exemption is on the community spouse. If that if that made sense. So yes. If the uh, if the veteran passes before the spouse, does the qualifying spouse then uh, still able to use the veteran's exemption, or is that lost? Okay, and I can tell that's a very personal question since you're wearing a veteran's hat, I presume. So, so yes, the, the, uh, our, our government, all the local governments allow the veteran's exemption belongs to the spouse of the veteran. So, so yes, so if a, if a veteran who has served in Vietnam happens to pass away, leave a spouse, she gets to continue with the exact same veteran's benefit for the real property tax purposes. So whether or not there's a life estate, uh, that's out there, so yes. Okay, the, what, what happens is again, we got the five year look back situation. So if we're, if we're past the five years, sell the house anytime, it doesn't matter. If, we're, if we are within the five years, then the house is not, you know, we really can't sell that. I mean, the house is not an exempt asset because we didn't get past the five years. When the house is sold and there's a life estate, the life estate has a valuation and then the, the kids get, so just used for simplicity purposes, the life estate's worth 10% and the, and the uh, kids' value is worth 90%. So when a house is sold out of a life estate, no matter when it is, before the five years, after the five years, if you're in the nursing home, if you're not, the life estate gets a value, again, calling it 10%. It's based on life expectancy. And then the balance goes to the kids. It, that's a great question. If, if you're on Medicaid or, and you sell the house, if within the five years, yes, then the, then the proceeds need to be applied to Medicaid or applied, come back to the family. That happens all the time. Or if, it's, if, the, if we've gotten past the five-year look back, that's where the five-year look back comes into play. If we've gotten past that, then the assets are protected. So. Okay, so we'll leave the house now and talk about other assets. Because so, so we, that's how you protect the house. It all relates back to the five-year look back. But if somebody has more assets, as a gentleman's question was getting at, if, if mom or dad has $200,000 as a community spouse or $100,000 if there's no community spouse, well, then they would not be Medicaid eligible because they have too much money. So then the question becomes, what do you do to try and protect that? And there's different, there's different planning techniques to do that. One is we deal with the five-year look back. So if, if mom and dad are doing planning in advance, more than five years in advance, those assets can be gifted away, frequently gifted away into a trust, a Medicaid qualifying trust, and then they're protected. So just to make a very complex situation simple, if mom or dad has 200,000 extra dollars and they take it and they give it to their kids and we'll just use in trust for a second, give them to their kids in trust, well now they don't have that 200,000. So if it's, if it's within five years and they go to apply for a nursing, go to a nursing home and apply for Medicaid, well then that's not protected. If it's more than five years, more than five years in a day, then that money is protected because that money does not belong to mom and dad anymore because it was gifted away. So that's, the, that's kind of the, the basic uh, planning technique for, uh, for elder law attorneys is you gift away your money in, in some form, either directly to the kids or into trust for the kids. So mom and dad don't have that money. So when they go into a nursing home, they would reach the qualification levels. 
No. So the question, that's a great question. The, que the question is, isn't there a limit on the amount that you can give away? The $15,000 limit is a, is a tax limit. That's an estate, that's a estate and gift tax limit. The, um, the amount that you can give away is actually unlimited. You can give away up to $10 million and pay no tax. So from a Medicaid perspective, or more than 10 million, so from a Medicaid perspective, there, you can give it all away. It's all about the five-year look back. So there is no restriction on what we give away. Yes, Chris. Yeah, I was just gonna say, this is where a lot of people get confused with the $15,000. If you give $20,000 Jeff gave me $20,000, I'll take it, um, first of all. Um, <laughs> Anytime, first. Yeah. But it's over the 15,000 threshold. I'll, I don't claim it as income, okay? The person who receives it never claims it as income, okay? Jeff has to file what's called a gift tax return. The, the confusing word there is tax. There is no gift tax. Okay, what that $5,000 threshold that he gave over does is reduce that $10 million estate down to $9,995,000. Okay, as far as I, I'm not worth $10 million. It's not going to hurt me if I give more than $15,000 away to one person. I think a majority in this room, you can give more than $15,000 away, and it's not going to impact you at all. Right. So what Chris's, what Chris's explanation really explains is that, that you can give away all your money, no, no tax consequence, and the, the consequence is from an elder law or a Medicaid perspective, but that consequence is only if it's within the five-year perspective. After the five-year time frame, then, then it, does, it doesn't apply, and Chris, Chris will explain it. The recipient receives money tax-free. When you give money away, it's tax-free. But in, in our context of elder law, when we're giving money to the kids, uh, that's always one of the issues. As we give the money to the kids, we got to make sure, and that's one, where, where trust comes into play, we got to make sure that the, that the money is going to be available for mom and dad potentially if they need it. So because if we give away the money and then mom or dad need to go into a facility two years from now, within two years after the gift, well, it's not protected. Well, you don't want to have it. It happens all the time. The money was given to the kids. Mom goes into the nursing home and she's not going to qualify for Medicaid and the kids have to give the money back because it's not, it, we, we're not going to be able to be eligible for Medicaid. So that's really, when we get above and beyond, just kind of to, to summarize what we've been talking about, when we, when we have more money than would, than would bring us to the eligibility levels for Medicaid, 15,000 single individual, 90,000 married couple, the family needs to plan for that if they want to. And, and a lot of families don't need to or you don't want to, you don't have to, but if there is that desire, that's the way it needs to be done and it needs to be done five years in advance. The only other thing to, to highlight is even when somebody goes into a uh, nursing home and if they have not planned in advance and they have more money than the Medicaid uh, qualification levels, there are things that can be done at the last minute. There's what you might call crisis Medicaid planning can be done. There's certain things that are, that are allowed under Medicaid law uh, to, to be done in terms of pre uh, protecting the assets, prepaying funerals, uh, and then there's, a, there's some planning that can be done with the assets to try and protect half of the assets by the use of what's called a promissory note. So, so what happens there, I guess the, the takeaway there is when somebody is in a situation where they go into a facility and there is money, I would always want them to consult with a qualified attorney to make sure that the family is accomplishing their goals. Because we, it's never too late to protect some of the money if, if that's what the family wants and if, we need to, if there is ways to do it. But it should always be looked at because otherwise you're just going to spend the $14,000 a month until you get down to the levels. And, and there's lots of families, I mean I meet with them all the time, they come in and they say, oh, Grandma went into the home, we never did anything, and she had $200,000 and spent it down to the $15,000 and then got on Medicaid. You know, and it's very painful for a family to have spent that kind of money uh, through the years. So, so there, are, there are certainly options available to protect the assets, even in the last, in the, in the, you know, in the last situation where somebody goes into a facility and has extra money. So, so I would always want you to come, you know, come see me or somebody like me to make sure that you're there, the families are availing themselves of any options that are out there. And Jeff, sorry, switching topics, so we can go back to this topic. I just want to stress to everybody the importance of if you have 401ks or IRAs, making sure you have a benefit.
beneficiary. Because if you don't have a beneficiary, it'll go to probate. Go to the estate, and the estate pays super high taxes. Right. right so, away. so Tiffany and Chris will give me a good opportunity. I'm going to leave elder law right now, and then we'll move on to the last topic, which is basic estate planning, which is where that fits in. Any other questions on elder law and protecting the assets and so forth? Yes. Uh, and, uh, Okay, well, the tr it depends. It, yeah, I understand the question. It depends on what the trust says. Uh, the short answer is it's it, under the terms of most irrevocable Medicaid qualifying trust, the answer is no. Okay, but in terms of family planning, that can be discussed within, within the family situation. But, but the trust itself controls the answer to that question, which is that the principal generally cannot be returned to mom or dad. The income can be returned to mom or dad. So, but that's one of the reasons to put it in the trust, because if there is an emergency situation, can an irrevocable trust be broken? Well, under certain situations, certainly. So if the whole family decides to, that they need to get rid of the irrevocable trust because mom needs the money back, well, done properly, that can happen. And the key word is irrevocable. In order for it to be a Medicaid qualifying trust, it needs to be irrevocable. There's another question back there? Yes. Correct. Now, if they pass, what happens to that? Okay. Uh, if, if somebody is on Medicaid, New York State has the right to impose a lien against the estate for any proceeds that would be coming to the family members, and that could be included, the 15150 as as an estate, then the New York State has a right to recover against that money. Some families try and work around that and get the money out so it could be protected again for the family members. But if, you know, again, going back to what Medicaid is, if Medicaid is paying for the family and there is money left over when the family, when the person passes away, Medicaid has a right to recover that. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. She also was receiving a spousal IRA while he was alive, I mean a spousal Social Security, which she lost when he died and then she got his Social Security. Okay. The pension involved. Uh, the only income she has is the income from the IRA, the $250,000 IRA, and, um, and Social Security. Uh, can she qualify for Right. Well, she, she can qualify for Medicaid either way. If there's, if there's income that is above the threshold, then that income just goes to pay the nursing home. Right. So, what, what if it's less? And if it's less than... No, no. Because whatever the distribution out of the IRA is, is would, would count as income and the rest could stay as a protected, in essence, as a protected asset. So, so let, you, yep. The first time speaking with about is roughly uh, 70 years old when she goes into the nursing home. Uh, so her R&D from the 250000 plus the Social Security, I'd like to say, is less than 3000 Yep. So cash, she, cash assets are a little under 15000 Right. So she'd get... So, Yes, so in that scenario, she'd get to qualify for Medicaid and they would not, not force you to increase that. So let me do this, because one, one of the disadvantages of allowing or, or encouraging questions is that it kind of it kind of runs, runs over the time. So let's hold the questions and let me kind of summarize up and then I'll, I'll be here, uh, I'll stay to a, a, a answer questions. So the last topic, which I'll try and do in a couple minutes, is, is just basic estate planning. You know, I'm an estate planning attorney. Most attorney, many attorneys are, uh, 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 capable of writing wills and so forth, but when you have a complex estate planning situation that involves trusts and so forth, I, I would certainly recommend that you that you go to an attorney who really specializes in the estate planning arena. Uh, when we're talking about estate planning, everybody should have at least a will. 
A will is the basic document that says, when I die, where does the assets go? Everybody should have a power of attorney. A power of attorney is an appointment of somebody else to make financial and legal decisions in the event that you are incapacitated. And for those who have had to do that for their parents, uh, you know how important that can be. And if you don't have that document, it can be a real a mess and have to go to court and do an Article 81 guardianship. So everybody, everybody here and everybody that I talk to should have a will, should have a power of attorney, should have health care directives, which would be a health care proxy, a living will, potentially a MOLST form. These are the documents that control end of life decision making or health care decision making in the event that you're not able to do so. So those are the cores of the estate planning, the will, the power of attorney, the health care directives uh, that everybody should have. The other estate planning documents or the other estate planning concerns that are out there is you should, you should have your, ben this is what Tiffany's question uh, got to, you gotta make sure that the beneficiaries are correct on your assets. If you have IRAs and you don't have a beneficiary, that can create an absolute mess for the family. Worse than that, if you have the wrong beneficiary. You know, in other words, if somebody has a beneficiary, whoever that is, is gonna receive the money regardless of, of uh, what the will says. The beneficiary takes priority. So, so basically when we talk about this last component, which is estate planning, the long and short of it is we just have to make sure that I would urge everybody to make sure your estate plan is right, current, the way that you want it, so that if something was to happen, we don't have any problems, you don't have any extra, uh, extra issues, any extra costs. There are ways of avoiding probate. Uh, if, that's, if that's a goal, we can use a trust to avoid probate or we can use, there are testamentary substitutes. It depends on everybody's family situation as to, as to what should be done. But the long and short of that is I would strongly urge everybody, uh, whether we're gonna do elder law planning, whether you're gonna do estate tax planning, make sure you do estate planning to make sure that all of that is in order uh, just in case uh, something happens, because unfortunately it will to all of us. So uh, with that, I think that really could kind of brings, uh, uh, brings to the end the, the, the three parts of what we've been talking about, estate taxes, elder law, and estate planning. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, uh, Esther and Chris and all the folks at EG Tax. I certainly uh, appreciate the friendship I've had with them for, uh, for many decades now, Esther. Yeah, and uh, happy to come out today. So. So, <laughs> That's right, Esther's, Esther's 25, just 25, perfect. So, so once again, folks, thanks, thanks for coming out. Happy to have this session. I'll, I'll hang around for a little bit. If anybody has any specific personal questions, feel free, uh, feel free to ask. And I, I am, you know, when I do these kind of things, this is what I do for a living. So certainly available to help you or your friends or your family if anybody does have any estate planning or elder law issues that I could help with. So thank you all very much. Opportunities, new partners, EG Tech.